was considered the preeminent theorist on the conflict of laws, and he was an admired scholar and beloved teacher at Duke, as well as at several other law schools, including the University of Pittsburgh, where he served as dean. Since the inception of the lecture, numerous scholars of the first rank have come to Duke from around the country to address a wide range of topics. Past Curry lecturers have included an astonishingly accomplished group of scholars. Just to give you a, a sense, I'm just going to read a few of them. Judge Guido Calabresi, Michael S. Moore, Pam Carlin, Martha Minow, Janet Halley, Reva Siegel, Heather Gerken, Akhil Lamar, Jack Goldsmith, and most recently in 2019, the late and great Deborah Roby. This series and the distinguished individual it was named for expresses faith and confidence in the idea that scholarship and academic inquiry are integral to efforts to make the world better, that research and study and data and analysis can light the path towards stronger societies, better laws, and more just systems. No event like this one can happen without a lot of logistical work behind the scenes. And in particular, I want to take thank our law school communications and IT teams for supporting the event, and Monica Roberson in the Dean's Office for her work in coordinating Professor Murray's visit. This brings me to our distinguished guest herself. Melissa Murray is the Frederick I. and Grace Stokes Professor of Law at New York University, as well as the Faculty Director of the Birnbaum Women's Leadership Network. She is a leading expert in family law, constitutional law, and reproductive justice. Many of you probably know Professor Murray as the co-host of the podcast, Strict Scrutiny. Nice t-shirt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which recently won the 2023 Ambie Award for Excellence in Audio for the topic of Best Politics or Opinion Podcast. Or you may know her for her incisive commentary on many television networks and in many newspapers. But Professor Murray is here today not only for her media presence, but for her equally groundbreaking work as a legal scholar which, of course, is part of what allows her to be such an effective teacher both to her students and to the general public. I first met Professor Murray when we were both starting out as junior family law scholars. We quickly found each other and recognized that we were fellow travelers. And over the years, I have been continually challenged and inspired by Professor Murray's ability to show me what I thought was true, it was not, and persuade me that I should think about the law as she does. Those of you in my family law class last fall may recall I taught a whole class based on one of her articles because she had persuaded me to think about the regulation of sex in a different way. One simple way of understanding Professor Murray's work is that it exposes the many ways in which family law, a field that we also often think of as concerning private behavior, is actually deployed as a form of regulation and governance in a very public way, including in the criminal law space. She has applied this theoretical lens to topics that run the gamut of family law issues, from the status of children born outside of marriage, to the criminalization of sexual activity, to the use of marriage as a punishment for the crime of seduction, to state-imposed sterilization, and to the newest restrictions on contraception and abortion. A hallmark of her approach as a scholar is her fearlessness in questioning the conventional wisdom about what constitutional cases mean and how they affect the everyday lives of millions of people, often in ways that create or reinforce racial or class hierarchies. This year, in light of the radically changed landscape for reproductive justice in the wake of the Supreme Court's ruling in the Dobbs case last summer, I really can't think of a scholar more equipped to deliver the Curry Memorial Lecture than Professor Murray. So please join me in welcoming her. Thank you. Thank you for that very generous introduction, Dean Abrams. Um, what she did not tell you is that when we met each other, it was very obvious that we should meet each other because we were both vulgarly pregnant and we ran into each other, um, literally. Um, but it is really a delight to be back here at Duke Law School and this time as the Brainerd Curry Distinguished Lecturer. Obviously, I did not know Professor Curry, but I did know someone who did. Professor Herma Hill Kay, who was the former dean of Berkeley Law and my very dear colleague and mentor, was a student of Brainerd Curry's when he was a professor at the University of Chicago, where, from which she graduated. Not only was Herma Brainerd Curry's student, she was his mentee. 
and her own groundbreaking work in the conflict of laws built on Curry's command of the field. Now, as Dean Abrams said, I do not work in the field of conflicts. Instead, Herma's mentorship of me was in the other field in which she was a titan, family law. But despite the misalignment of our subject matter, I know that Brainerd Curry's mentorship of Herma laid the foundation for her career in the academy, and her mentorship in turn has been the foundation of mine. So this is not just an honor and a privilege, but perhaps also a journey come full circle. And for that, I am very grateful. I'm also incredibly grateful to the tenacity of Monica Roberson, who <laughs> has learned that I'm a terrible email correspondent, but nonetheless has kept the faith and has brought me here today. So thank you to Monica and to everyone in the Dean's office and to all of you. As Dean Abrams said, my paper that, on which this lecture is based focuses on the issues raised by the Supreme Court's recent opinion in Dobbs versus Jackson's Women's Health Organization, and specifically that opinion's invocation of democracy and democratic deliberation. So Justice Samuel Alito, in writing that majority opinion, repeatedly claimed that the court's 1973 decision in Roe versus Wade preempted debate and state legislative deliberation on the fraught and vexed issue of abortion rights. And the opinion insisted that democratic deliberation was and should be the proper mechanism for resolving the competing interests at stake in the abortion debate. Put simply, according to Justice Alito and the majority, Roe and subsequently Casey had wrested this issue of abortion from the people, misguidedly enshrined it as a fundamental right and in doing so, cut off the people's right to debate this issue amongst themselves. On this account, in overruling Roe and Casey, the court was doing no more than rightfully returning the question of abortion to the people and the prospect of democratic deliberation. Now, this invocation of democracy has undeniable rhetorical power. It allows the Dobb majority to lay waste to nearly 50 years worth of precedent, all while rebutting charges of judicial activism. In this article, which is forthcoming in the Harvard Law Review, Kate Shaw and I interrogate Dobbs' claim to vindicate principles of democracy. And in doing so, we examine both the opinion's reliance on this narrative that Roe disrupted democratic deliberation, and we interrogate the intellectual pedigree of that argument. We also consider the opinion's substantive vision of democracy and consider as well the other purposes that the court's invocation of the values and vernacular of democracy might serve as we proceed to now a post-Dobbs future. So by way of a roadmap for the talk, I'm going to first talk about the court's reliance on the argument that Roe and later Casey disrupted ongoing democratic deliberation at the state level. And as I'll explain, the Dobbs majority insisted that this critique of Roe, of disrupting democratic deliberation, had always attended Roe. But as we show, in the immediate aftermath of Roe, most of the critique focused on an entirely different question, the court's misguided understanding of fundamental rights. It was only later that this issue of democratic deliberation emerged as a critique of Roe, and again, it emerged through a series of legal and political developments aimed at dismantling and discrediting and ultimately toppling Roe and Casey. And in doing so, we argue, the reliance on this narrative of disrupted democratic deliberation may have profound consequences for the court's jurisprudence in other areas going forward. Having identified those intellectual origins of the democratic deliberation narrative and its contemporary consequences, I'll then move to consider the Dobbs majority's vision of dem democracy. And as we explain, although the Dobbs majority traffics in the rhetoric of democracy, its conception of democracy is both internally inconsistent and extraordinarily myopic. And this cramped conception of democracy is even more pronounced when considered alongside the court's more recent and active interventions to distort and disrupt the electoral landscape. On this account, Dobbs purports to return the abortion question to the people and to the prospect of democratic deliberation 
at the precise moment when the court and its own decisions have ensured that the political landscape is unlikely either to produce genuine deliberation or to yield widely desired outcomes. Finally, I'll consider what the Dobbs majority's preoccupation with democracy and democratic deliberation may mean for the future of reproductive freedom. A close examination of the opinion suggests that the majority may have employed the values and vernacular of democracy not simply as a vehicle for restoring the abortion question to the people, but perhaps for more cynical purposes. As we explain, the majority's embrace of democracy and deliberation not only shields the overruling of Roe and Casey from claims of judicial activism and overreach, it also may lay the groundwork for the eventual vindication and protection of fetal personhood. So with those caveats duly issued, let me proceed to this. All of this taken together, I think, leads inexorably to the view that the Dobbs majority's purported state-by-state -state settlement of the abortion question is unlikely to be a lasting settlement. And indeed, aspects of this opinion suggest that its interest in democracy merely serves as a way station and route to a more permanent resolution to the abortion question, the recognition of fetal personhood and the total abolition of legal abortion in the United States. So let me first discuss this history around this argument about disrupted democratic deliberation. As I suggested in the roadmap, the job majority makes much of the notion that Roe and then later Casey disrupted ongoing debate at the state level over abortion rights. And critically, this notion of democratic engagement undergirds much of the majority's disdain for Roe. And ultimately, it underwrites the majority's decision to overrule this nearly 50-year-old precedent. The view that Roe disrupted ongoing democratic debate is such a well-worn trope in discussions of abortion rights that many, including the Dobbs majority, take for granted that the critique had always attended Roe. But is that correct? As we show in the immediate wake of Roe, few people were actually focused on the question of frustrated popular debate. Instead, most of the criticism in the wake of Roe focused on what many viewed as the court's misguided understanding of fundamental rights. The view that Roe disrupted ongoing democratic deliberation on abortion surfaced only briefly in the dissents in Roe versus Wade and its companion case Doe versus Bolton, and principally in Byron White's dissent in Doe versus Bolton, in which he maintained that the court's decision in both cases stripped, quote, the people and legislatures of the 50 states of the opportunity to weigh the relative importance of the continued existence and development of the fetus on the one hand against a spectrum of possible impacts on the mother on the other hand. Such a vexed and sensitive issue, White intoned, was better left with the people and to the political processes. But to be clear, in the immediate aftermath of Roe, White was a lonely voice of one on this question. In voicing the concern that the court had usurped this issue that was best left to the legislature, only White was making this point. And he soon abandoned this particular hobby horse to make the case, as many others were, that the real problem with Roe was that it improperly identified a fundamental right that did not exist. In this regard, White was aligned with most juridical and scholarly critiques of Roe, including famously John Hart Ely's Yale Law Journal essay, The Wages of Crying Wolf. There, Ely lambasted the Roe Court and its reasoning with regard to the identification of a fundamental right, insisting that it had very little to do with constitutional law. Now, I say all of this to make clear that at least in the immediate aftermath of Roe, the critiques of the decision, and there were many critiques of the decision, but they all focused principally on the process of divining and recognizing constitutional rights, not on the prospect of disrupting the people's prerogative to decide certain issues. And indeed, it would take roughly 10 years for the critique of Roe as disrupting ongoing democratic deliberation on the abortion issue to surface concretely. But surface it did. In the mid-1980s, perhaps buoyed by the court's changing composition and the growing number of Roe skeptics among the new justices, 
Justice White reprised his earlier critique of Roe as disrupting ongoing state deliberation on the contested abortion issue. And he did so in a conscious attempt to connect democratic deliberation to a more controversial point about stare decisis and the court's obligation to adhere to past precedents. Dissenting from the court's decision in Thornburg versus ACOG, Justice White reiterated his view that Roe, quote, departs from a proper understanding of the Constitution. But meaningfully, he also went further to make the case that stare decisis considerations were less weighty in circumstances where the court was exercising its judicial power to, quote, restore authority to its proper possessors by correcting constitutional decisions that, on reconsideration, are found to be mistaken. White's position, with its implications for stare decisis, found a strong reception outside of the court. In the immediate aftermath of Roe, the pro-life movement had mobilized around various frontal attacks on Roe, including federal constitutional amendments that would overrule the decision, abolish abortion, and recognize and protect fetal life. But when these efforts stalled in the 1970s, abortion opponents began to consider new strategies, strategies that would be more palatable to the broader public than fetal personhood and the prospect of complete abolition of abortion. One strategy, championed by a young Justice Department lawyer named Samuel Alito, involved chipping away at abortion access through regulations that made abortion increasingly difficult, expensive, and logistically complicated, both to provide and to access. But a second strategy, again, sounded in the register of democratic deliberation and focused squarely on the idea that Roe involved impermissible judicial overreach and that the abortion regulation decision should be one for the states to address. Now, to be sure, for many in the pro-life movement, this appeal to state-level democracy was a second-best intermediate position, one that was fundamentally incompatible with the substantive position that the fetus was a person and that any process that terminated a pregnancy was tantamount to murder. But with the prospect of a constitutional amendment well out of reach, many in the pro-life movement viewed this intermediate position as a necessary way station on the path that could lead first to Roe's reversal and then ultimately to the elimination of all protection for abortion. And so, taking the long view, the movement hitched its wagon to the North Stars of democracy and popular deliberation. And in Dobbs, we see this discursive strategy coming full circle. The appeal to democracy was a critical component of the majority's justification for overruling Roe and Casey. But as we explain in the paper, the appeal to democracy may also have jurisprudential implications beyond simply overruling these two embattled precedents. As we know, Casey did more than simply reaffirm Roe. According to then judge, now Justice Brett Kavanaugh, Casey is precedent on precedent and identifies a standard for lower courts and the Supreme Courts to consider as they make the decision about whether to maintain faith with an existing precedent. So Casey identifies a series of factors that courts should consider in determining whether stare decisis effect is warranted for an extant precedent. Among the factors that Casey identified were the quality of the decision's reasoning, its practical workability, its reliance interests, whether there are significant developments in related principles of law, or if there are new facts that have emerged, or, quote, special considerations, end quote, that rob the old rule of significant application or justification. With those indicia in mind, one way that we might understand the Dobbs majority's preoccupation with democratic deliberation is as a special consideration that would justify departing from the edicts of stare decisis. Put differently, as in Dobbs, an earlier precedent's arguable inter interruption of democratic deliberation on a sensitive or divisive issue could qualify as, quote, a special justification or consideration that blunts the stare decisis force of the precedent. A second possibility is perhaps even more alarming, that the court's invocation of democracy and democratic deliberation gestures toward an entirely new standard for stare decisis. On this account, a past precedent is not entitled to stare decisis effect where its subject matter involves an issue that the court believes to be of high salience to the American people and where, in the court's view, 
the earlier precedent interrupted the prospect of democratic deliberation on that issue. Now, if that is the case, and Dobbs has injected new factors or perhaps an entirely new test for stare decisis, it begs the question, what other precedents might be affected by a court that is increasingly willing, perhaps even eager, to identify special considerations that justify departing from precedent? Well, if the court's new vision of stare decisis is concerned with an issue's importance to the American people and whether an earlier opinion usurped the power to address a question of profound moral and social importance, it is very likely that Obergefell versus Hodges, in which the court held that the Constitution did not permit states to restrict marriage to opposite-sex couples, is high on the list of possible targets. The court decided Obergefell in 2015 during a moment of undeniable churn in state marriage laws. As Chief Justice Roberts intoned in his dissent in Obergefell, the Obergefell majority, quote, sees for itself a question the Constitution leaves to the people at a time when the people are engaged in a vibrant debate on that question, end quote. Of course, the present court is differently constituted than the Obergefell court. But these personnel changes may not necessarily dispel anxiety about fidelity to presidents. Indeed, it might exacerbate. Although Justice Scalia is no longer on the court, the Chief Justice and Justices Thomas and Alito comprise the core of a conservative supermajority. Further, the addition of the three new Trump appointees whose own views of stare decisis have affected significant changes in the court's jurisprudence suggests that there is already a strong majority that, at the very least, might be willing to consider whether judicial resolution of marriage equality went too far, frustrating the will of the people. Now, of course, the Dobbs majority's interest in democracy and democratic deliberation arguably goes beyond furnishing justifications to depart from stare decisis. At some level, the majority's interest in restoring the abortion question to the people and the democratic process reflects the view that democracy, rather than jurisprudence, is the best way to resolve this vexed question. But this too prompts a question. What is the Dobbs majority's vision of democracy? Well, as we explain here, the Dobbs majority subscribes to an extraordinarily myopic and thin conception of democracy. First, when the majority discusses democracy, it focuses almost exclusively on state legislatures, repeatedly invoking these bodies as the paradigmatic example of representative democracy. Yet, as a result of gerrymandering, state legislatures are often the least representative institutions in state government. And the court's emphasis on state legislatures as arbiters of democracy belies the role that state judiciaries may play in reproductive rights, as well as the roles that state executive officials, governors, and attorneys general may play in enforcing and vetoing restrictive abortion policies. And critically, in many states, judges and executive actors run for state office statewide and are elected by many more voters than the average member of the state legislature. In addition to its inattention to these other constitutional actors, the Dobbs Court conspicuously makes no mention of the prospect of direct democracy. But as we know, in the aftermath of Dobbs, a number of states have used ballot initiatives and voter referenda to protect reproductive rights under state law. The Dobbs majority's neglect of these other state constitutional actors and the prospect of direct democracy leads then to yet another form of myopia, directional myopia. The Dobbs court understands democratic deliberation on abortion rights to proceed in only one direction, toward the further restriction of abortion rights. It does not even conceive of the possibility that such deliberation might lead to the preservation or radically the expansion of reproductive freedom. Now, this is especially curious given the majority's repeated reminders that before Roe, debate was occurring at the state level and proponents of liberal abortion rights had succeeded in some measure in persuading their fellow citizens of the rightness of their cause. The majority opinion, in addition to being myopic about the direction that change might take, is also myopic in its understanding of how political power is accumulated and is wielded. It reduces 
political power to the act of voting or perhaps running for office. And as Justice Alito notes, when it comes to participation, women are registered to vote and turn out to vote at higher rates than men. Well done, ladies. <laughs> but even putting aside the significant obstacles that women, who are often the primary caregivers in their families, must surmount to actually exercise the franchise or run for political office, if we use any metric beyond simply voting to measure democratic participation, an entirely different empirical portrait comes into view. For example, women are grossly underrepresented in state legislatures and in Congress. They are underrepresented in state and federal executive positions and in state and federal judicial posts. They are woefully underrepresented in the ecosystem that surrounds politics. They are a minority of federal lobbyists, and they donate to political campaigns at lower rates than men. Their political power cannot be reduced simply to voting, but must take into account these other aspects of political participation in which they are at a severe disadvantage relative to men. In addition to advancing an uncritical and perhaps facile vision of political power and its exercise, the court's vindication of democratic deliberation prioritizes and privileges moments of democratic debate that included only some members of the political community. For example, when the Dobbs majority insists that Roe interrupted state-level debate and deliberation on abortion, it is often referring to mid-20th century debates over whether to repeal or liberalize then extant abortion restrictions. What's missing from this account of these debates is the fact that the laws and policies being debated at mid-20th century were laws and policies enacted earlier through democratic processes that were categorically closed to all but white men. On this account, the debates that Roe preempted and that the Dobbs majority prioritizes and seeks to vindicate in returning the abortion question to the states were debates over whether to retain or liberalize laws that were themselves enacted under conditions of extreme democratic deficit. Relatedly, the court's history and tradition method that it uses to hold that the Constitution does not protect a right to abortion also reveals its hollow commitment to democracy. The Dobbs Court's attention to history and tradition consists primarily of examining a slew of mid-19th century statutes enacted during a wave of nativist furor aimed at increasing the birthright among native-born white women. And again, the laws that the majority cites for this purpose were enacted in an era in which women could not vote, could not run for political office, and were not understood as full and equal members of the polity. Put differently, in both its recitation of the legislation and policies that we need to consider and its understanding of the debate that was ongoing and frustrated, and in its method of constitutional interpretation, the Dobbs majority insists on binding the contemporary meaning of the Constitution to a body of law and authority in whose enactment and creation neither women nor people of color played any part. It is the absolute antithesis of democracy. And this hollow commitment to democracy is even more pronounced when considered alongside the court's other interventions which have actively distorted and disrupted the landscape of democracy today. As we discuss in the paper, Dobbs arrives in the wake of a series of high court decisions that have blessed partisan gerrymandering, hobbled the Voting Rights Act, and made our democracy decidedly less representative and less democratic. But perhaps the most troubling aspect of the Dobbs majority's invocation of democracy is its cynicism, its deployment of the vernacular and values of democracy in service of an end goal that is decidedly out of step with majoritarian preferences that favor abortion rights. So what do I mean by this? In its dismantling of Roe, the Dobbs majority repeatedly referenced John Hart Ely's essay, The Wages of Crying Wolf. In Wages, Ely criticized Roe for lacking a foundation in constitutional law, but he did not stop there. Roe's other fundamental flaw, he noted, was that in prioritizing the pregnant woman and her needs, Roe failed to grapple fully with the, quote, compelling interest in the protection of the fetus. 
Ely then made the point even more plain in a subsequent passage. As he acknowledged, women, despite being roughly half of the population, very often lacked political power in the United States. Compared with men, very few women sit on our legislatures, he reminded us. But, Ely noted, women's political powerlessness paled in comparison to another entity's vulnerability. As Ely intoned, no fetuses sit on our legislatures. If the court's obligation is to use judicial review to, among other things, protect discrete and insular minorities who are powerless to press their interests in majoritarian processes, then Roe's vindication of the pregnant woman's rights left the fetus utterly bereft of any form of judicial protection. And critically, this account of the fetus as an underrepresented, vulnerable constituency in need of judicial protection can be glimpsed throughout Dobbs. Throughout the opinion, there are repeated references to the fetus and an acknowledgement that many among the public view the fetus as, quote, an unborn human being. But perhaps most telling on this front is the majority's discussion of abortion's, quote, eugenic potential. In footnote 41 of the majority opinion, the Dobbs majority reiterates a view long husbanded by Justice Clarence Thomas that those who seek liberal access to abortion have been motivated by a desire to suppress the size of the African-American population. Now, to be sure, the Dobbs majority's nod to the abortion as racial genocide argument is on some level gratuitous, given that the decision to overrule Roe and Casey rests on the view that the abortion right is unmoored from constitutional text and lacks deep roots in the history and traditions of this country. But if the footnote does not serve a jurisprudential purpose in Dobbs, it surely serves an important discursive purpose because it builds the case for viewing limits on abortion as anti-discrimination measures, and more importantly, for eventually viewing the fetus as a minority in need of judicial protection. Critically then, the majority's interest in Ely's wages goes beyond simply allowing the court to reframe its actions in more politically palatable terms as a democracy-enhancing endeavor. It suggests that the majority's vision of democracy and its invocation of democratic deliberation on abortion does not end with returning abortion to the states, as Justice Alito suggested, but rather with an acknowledgement of the constitutional interests of the unborn. In this regard, Dobbs's invocation of democracy alongside these other discursive maneuvers has the broader potential to reshape, however subtly, our understanding of who is in the polity and the identity of the discrete and insular minorities whom the court is obliged to protect. And there are hints in the opinion that this is indeed afoot. The majority's decision to focus primarily on principles of democracy rather than the illegitimacy of the doctrine of substantive due process may reflect a desire to preserve for the future reliance on substantive due process to justify constitutionalizing a rule that would prohibit all abortions in the name of fetal life. And indeed, the court's repeated references to both fetal life and unborn human beings may be designed both to lay the foundations for constitutionalizing such a rule and to broadcast to litigants and lower courts the court's receptivity to such claims. With all of this in mind, Dobbs's democratic state-by-state -state settlement is likely not the end, but rather a way station. Instead, the true potential of the Dobbs majority's vision of democracy-enhancing jurisprudence likely will only be achieved when the rights of an overlooked discrete insular minority, the fetus, are finally recognized, whether through majoritarian politics or through judicial fiat. Thank you.